Okay. Which side do you want to be on? Uh, on the right, on the right. On the right. Okay. So, thank you for being such a wonderful audience. I'm Carrie Perloff. I probably know most of you, but I'm the uh, artistic director here. And I directed the show, and this is our playwright, Glenn Berger. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. <laughs> So I said to Glenn right before, this is going to be like one of those reality TV shows because we've never met each other. So <laughs> it's like watching a dating game live <laughs> for the first time. But um, I, have, I have followed and loved his work for a very long time and loved this play for a very long time. And uh, he wasn't with us in rehearsal, but he was there in spirit, we felt. That, yeah, no, it was <laughs> like ghostly. We hope. And, uh, <laughs> And so, and Glenn wrote this very beautiful uh, little prologue to the piece, which is in the program, but I thought we would just start and just talk for a minute, because it's such an incredibly imaginative piece, and it's very humbling, because he wrote it very young. But just <laughs> what the first, I mean, it's such a wild story, what the impulse was, what, what was the uh, sort of original idea that got you going on this story? Uh, yeah, that was a while ago. I, <laughs> I want to thank all of you for coming. It's really gratifying to... Um, to uh, have anybody see this. <laughs> is that all there is? Seri no well, stragglers? No, I know yeah. you, that's right, <laughs> let's make sure. I, you know, because you sit in the room and you think, you know, well, I'll, I'll write this thing, um, and there's no one else in that room, and, and you think maybe, maybe there will be no one else ever in a room. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, yes, I don't know. Um, you know, I heard uh, all my work um, is inspired by some uh, piece of music. Um, I I'm working on something now that was inspired by a song by the Kingston Trio um, about a long black rifle. But this one was wow. um, this one was uh, about uh, klezmer music from the 1920s. I was um, I was in a terrible place, depressed, and I think I was this, I was young. I was living back with my parents even, <laughs> and I was. Um, I That'll thought, you know what, if I find, uh, a, a, there's this type of music in my head, and if I find it, everything will be fine again. So I went to the record stores, and I bought, um, uh, you know, uh, gypsy music, and, and you know, uh, uh, Croatian accordion tunes, and I had a notion of what I was looking for, but not quite, and I was spending way too much money, and I, I thought, that's it, enough. All right, I'll go to one more place, and, and I picked up this tape, of uh, Dave Terrace, who was a klezmer clarinetist from the 30s, 20s, um, and uh, stuck it in the car stereo on my way home, and I thought, that's, mm. that's it. <laughs> and how, how, how odd, because uh, it's Jewish music. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have thought that, because uh, I had given up on, on all of that years ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we have in it's common like, with the bad Jews. I, uh, not Jewish music. So, um, so, but there was something in it, and it would, it would be years later before I wrote this, but I, I, there was something in this kind of um, melancholy mm. um, exuberance mm. you know, um, that I, I wanted to capture, and, and I thought at first it was going to be, you know, many people in this play, or, um, and eventually it became, it just became a, a, a lecture that, that, began to um, cover a whole lot of history, and that's all I'm really ever trying to do, is how do you cover as much history as you possibly can? Um, <laughs> you know, because you, you, if you don't have the perspective, uh, you're not going to get any meaning out of anything. So, so yeah, so it started from there. And, and you performed it, is that right? The first performance of it was at the Yale uh, cabaret, it was a tiny little space. Um, somebody asked, uh, the curator there said, do you have any plays? I said, I, I don't, but I could write something maybe. Yes, David. <laughs> Glenn Berger, David Thank Strip there. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> that, I, I can't, wow. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Um, yes. So yeah, so I was just He's saying, talking about his I was just saying how I performed it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to great acclaim in front of uh, five people. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, you know, I, I, I knew um, no one else would be able to memorize it in time to memorize it. That alone is something. And, um, and uh, so I did it. And so I kind of, I 
wrote it based on my very tiny spectrum of abilities. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and, then, um, and then I was the understudy in New York and wound up um, performing it uh, about a hundred times. And um, the uh, actor um, who had been in it was um, complaining about the, some transitions. And I said, I'll just do it already. What's your problem? And, uh, and then I had to do it, and he was completely right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so on, actually on stage one night, I began messing with it and was able to um, fix it a little, a little bit. And, uh, but yeah, huh. so. <laughs> so one of the things we've been dying to ask you, because so this is David Strathairn, whom you all just got to see, bravo. Mm -hmm. And um, it is an amazing experience to work on this piece. Um, amazing. And David had pretty much learned it by the time we got into rehearsal, because we talked about doing it maybe six months ago at least, right, or a year ago. But here's the thing that's really challenging about doing it, and you might be able to speak more to this, and I'm so curious what you felt. Because the conceit of it is he's lived through all of this discovery by the time he comes out to give the lecture. And yet during the lecture, as as sort of as when you're describing a dream and then you suddenly live the dream again, he goes into the emotional experience of these discoveries or this incredible grief about Rosa van der Vaart or whatever, and then comes back out the other end and continues the lecture. And so I think that's the thing we kept wrestling with, right? This sort of when is he inside of that experience and when is he, you, when is he outside of it and directing? Am I expressing this right? Or do you want to talk about that? No, that's, yeah. That's, that's. <laughs> yeah, well. That's it, the hard part. And, 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 the, and then you think, well, uh, how do you justify that as, a, as you know, the, it's like so many of those other things. You, you amass all this stuff and you think, oh, you know, I've got more than, than I need to prove the existence of God here. So I'm just going to wing it, you know, for the rest of it. And, uh, and then you realize, oh, uh, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe I should have been more prepared. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, in other words, so do you think he's, I mean, obviously he doesn't see that meltdown coming. No. So it's absolutely in real time, and yet he came out there intending to frame the lecture somehow. That's right, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, the, uh, I mean, for me, I always imagined, uh, oh, oh yeah, you know, he had a basic sketch, and by, by then the audience will be putty in his hands, and, and, they'll, and they'll spread the word. Um, and, <laughs> uh, <laughs> But, um, I mean, it's, it's a very, I have to say, uh, it is a funny thing because um, I, I, I did imagine this play, um, you know, most likely happening um, in an in a auditorium of, you know, that could fit maybe 12 people <laughs> and half, um, half sold. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and, and so there... Um, <laughs> You know the the um, the fact that that he was able to actually get a good audience today was um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's hope Very yet. Very gratifying, exactly. For the yeah. word of God. <laughs> well, we we wrote Glenn right at the beginning of rehearsal because David said, "How can I say that first line? Is that all there is? Because we're at the Geary, and usually there are a lot of people here." And um, and so you did a little rewriting on that. I did, well, yes, because the original line was, "Is this all there is?" Um, uh, uh, it, you know, with the, I, I wanted to give directors of the show um, a little bit of an out. <laughs> um, you know that 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 it really did have the <laughs> the, the, the sense of um, oh maybe eleven people came in from the rain. They're homeless, maybe. <laughs> um, they're not even. They're just trying to get some sleep. And this guy on stage is is talking. Um, and you know, when I was doing it in New York, some nights we had fantastic audiences, and some nights it was eleven people in from the rain, and half of them were homeless. Um, and then, and then this very weird thing happens because then you, you know, as a amateur actor, my first thought is. Uh, what's the point? <laughs> what's the point? <laughs> and then you go out there, and they're people, and 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 you have a moment, a, a, a chance to to communicate, even with you know one single person, and suddenly um, you know life becomes a little meaningful for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> now you presume this play has been translated into dozens of languages, or yeah. a lot, and done 
really all over the world. And I know you've seen yeah, a lot of different... Yeah, it's called like uh, self-actualization, I think. Because, <laughs> it, you know, it's the story of a man who goes all over the world trying to tell this story, and it wound up being <laughs> that. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. so, wild. Yeah. So yeah. tell me about your experience of, of seeing it in different contexts, or what, what has surprised you, or for instance, just your experience watching it today. What... what yeah. Because I'm sure it's incredibly different. It is, and sometimes it's it's the most depressing days of my life. <laughs> uh, tonight, you know, gratifyingly, it wasn't. Um, no, it's it's you know, it's always fascinating as a playwright to um, to write something, and it's not like a film where that's the one version and it's in the can forever and ever. Uh, the idea is that it's a breathing, living thing, and other people get to take it and uh, do what they um, feel needs doing with it. Um, so I haven't seen this show in years. Um, I kind of swore off it uh, because hmm. um, I, I just wasn't sure um, what, you know, mm. if I could. And, um, but, mm. but I wasn't going to miss this one. Do, and, do, um, does, does, do other cultures, so to speak, re react differently? Like in other... It was a, it, it did, it, Canada seems to love it. Can and, yeah. um, the Canadians have that mordant melancholy. I, I yeah. guess so. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> they live with a lot of big open spaces. Yeah, yeah may, maybe. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it, I mean, I do get, I get letters from Australia and, and um, mm. Greece that mm. I can't even read. Um, and um, uh, I mean, the, mm. what is interesting, I just, I like being in the auditorium. I, I did, w uh, watching it. There's that moment on stage when you're singing, we're here because we're here the second time. And what I found, performing it even, you know, you're, you're dead tired by that point as an actor. And I, there comes a moment when, when the, the play kind of just sort of melts away and you're really just a person, um, just here. And mm -hmm. th instead of an audience, it's just people mm -hmm. here. And, and we're all just sort of mm -hmm. here, breathing together, you know? I was, um, you know, I, I, I was performing it once and um, I, I saw this uh, little insect on, on the stage. Um, it, was, uh, it was just this um, <laughs> like little, like... Um, Cockroach, okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure what it was. It kind of... <laughs> Not on our stage. Scurried up. Well, look, they're here. The insects are here. Yeah. And, and, and you know, the there's, couch. right, there's, yeah. that, there's that line. But, and that, it started this tradition to me that for every tech, for every show, I, I look for, um, the first day of tech, I look for an insect on that stage to remind <laughs> me that there's real lives going on right. at the same time, you know, and that we're all, um, we're all sort of um, <laughs> in this together. Yeah. So yeah. one of the things that's interesting about working on this piece is it's just written as a monologue. There are almost no stage directions, pretty much. Yeah. Sometimes it says he writes a date. And all it says in the beginning is it starts as a lecture and it evolves into a play. I think it's something, right? Something like that. So obviously it's up to, you know, part of, for us, what was really pleasurable about working on it was figuring out how far could we go theatrically without illustrating everything, but just all the things that are already in the space, like the, the orange cone and that, you know, that everything yeah, yeah. just sort of becomes in the storytelling, the man with the yellow hat or the, you know, the cross or whatever, that's just there, you know? Um, and uh, it was really fascinating to just find and edit and see how theatrical we could make it, but also just, um, you know, in a sense, stay true to the lecture form. Well, theater, you know, I'm, man, what is it? It's like, it, I mean, it, it, what's really great is when you, um, it, it's investing, uh, yeah, you know, the objects or whatever with, with meaning, you know, and, and it could be, um, you could be miming something and people are, are seeing it, you know, yeah. or you can say, you know, you can hold up, um, you know, a brush and say, this is, this is the, you know, the Holy Grail and they, and they, they take your word for it. And that, you know, to me, this idea of, um, you know, what is, what is faith even, mm. um, that leap of faith that, uh, you know, Kierkegaard said was so hard. Right. Audiences do it every time they go to the theater. 
they, they make that leap, um, they, they're ready to, to, to go with you, and they're ready to uh, empathize with people that they know don't even exist. And, uh, you know what I mean? And so, yeah. and so, so, so what, what y you guys do in underneath the lintel, you know, when you're investing, you know, that as suddenly it's, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the cross, you know, or, or um, you know, or, or anything. Um, you're, you're doing what the librarian is doing with his scraps, right. and it doesn't um, undermine or take away from, um, from, from that act. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, we, we've, we've been calling this our anti-technology play because, uh, <laughs> you know, we're about to open a, a new small theater in mid-market right next to Twitter and all the technology companies, and there's nothing more humiliating than feeling completely um, like a dinosaur next to <laughs> the behemoth of 140 characters. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's really, I've been very depressed about it, to be honest. And, and so what's so revivifying to me about this play is it's just a guy telling a story. And it's like a group of people sitting around a campfire. And every day, and I don't know how you felt, I'm sure every audience is different, but there is that moment where you just feel that's the power of it, right? Just the live nakedness of here I am, and maybe someone's sleeping in the front row, and maybe they're fascinated, and maybe they're... But that actually that, that, that irreducible liveness is part of that, the magic of it, the sort of faith of it. Yeah. And somehow that's very revivifying at this moment, <laughs> you know? That's right. Mm -hmm. Don't you feel? Oh, yeah. Now, yeah. for you, David, and <laughs> you can say no. <laughs> <laughs> having, uh, having, you know, gone through the rehearsal process and then, and now discovered what it feels like to tell this story to an audience, what's that discovery process been like? And are there things that halfway through you thought, God, I wish we could ask Glenn about this? Um, it, it is different every night. Um, and there are people who sleep, and that's quite all right. Um, <laughs> and because but none of you. Maybe they need to sleep, that's fine. Yeah, that, that's what I, when I was doing it, I, and I would get upset, it's, they would fall asleep, and, and then you would notice, wait, I didn't even open my mouth, and they, they're asleep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and then you realize, oh, they're those poor people, they're yeah, overworked you know. people. <laughs> it's quite all right, but it, it, it does have a, uh, uh, sort of an, an engine of its own, that once you start that snowball rolling, you, you, you can't get out of the way of it. Um, and for the most part, I think the audience is, it, 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 it works on a lot of different levels. I mean, it, it's very funny. I didn't expect it to be as funny, but his sort of self-deprecation and, and, you know, the way he sort of constructs his, his moments, it's very, it's humorous, it's charming, and it's also quite telling, I think. But it's also, there's a lot of stuff in there where it gets very quiet, and I think maybe they're thinking about some of the ideas that you've, you've presented. And, and, and that's, that's good. You just kind of have to trust that silence. Yeah. Uh, in a place this big, that kind of silence can be really scary. Daunting, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But it's beautiful. Yeah. It's, it's, it's also, maybe, maybe they're with you, maybe they're not, but uh, they're being polite at least. And, um, <laughs> you know, but... But it has a lot in it that, I, that I, I think, no matter how big or small the audience is, there's going to be something for everybody. Can I ask you, as you started to play out the evidences, how <coughs> tightly, I mean, how much did you want to stitch his identity with this myth? Or how open-ended do you want that to be at the end? Yeah, no, I, I mean... It did wind up getting stitched pretty closely, and 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 ultimately that became part of the intention. Um, and uh, and you know what did attract me from the beginning was the 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 idea that it was going to be a one-person show by somebody who's really never been on a stage before. And is a Dutch but, librarian. Yeah, <laughs> he's never been on a stage before. But he likes it. He he, <laughs> he thinks he <laughs> likes it. But um. But but yeah. And and this idea that uh. Yeah. Not until I guess the end does he really. Th does maybe it, the penny drop for him? Oh I, yeah. We're we're two peas in a pod. M me and me and this wandering mm -hmm. fellow. Did you know the myth of the wandering Jew? I mean, is this something you sort of had in the back of your mind as you? Were no. Only until um. 
I, I actually, I, it was a process of discovery, this, this one. Um, I mean, I love mapping things out to a, you know, fairly well. And with this one, it was really, I don't know where this is. Oh, the wandering Jew, that's right. And, and then it did kind of come together. Hmm. So the other reason Glenn is out here, even though he really just wanted to come see us, is that um, <laughs> he was also the book writer of the now infamous Spider-Man the Musical. And he wrote a book about it, which is yes, out in the did. lobby, and he <laughs> will sign it for you afterwards if you would like one, about the journey of that musical <laughs> and what happened, which is that everybody got fired, or a lot of people <laughs> got fired. Some got fired and some just, just, just got depressed. <laughs> <laughs> So tell us a little bit about, since I haven't gotten to see the book yet, but he did do a signing last night in the Castro. Yeah. Sort of, now do you feel you've passed through that crucible because the book is done and you can move on? Or what, what, what was the big aha? Was there a Yeah, no, the, the, yeah, the book is, uh, I mean, they're basically practically the same thing underneath the lintel and Spider-Man. Um. <laughs> we tried to get David to fly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, the, um, no, you know, I, I wanted, the, it's an amazing <laughs> story, again, story, story. Of, um, of, of what, of, of ultimately of, uh, it's a story about storytelling. It's a story of, of human beings have a thing, uh, uh, first stories of, of, of taking random events and, and, finding the cause and effect and finding patterns and, and creating this narrative. And, and that's, that's we, why we put things on stage. So there's a story of these brilliant people um, who, who had this need to put this story on stage and, and, the, and audiences need to understand that story. Um, and that kind of um, all the challenges and exasperation uh, that, that came out of that. It's a story of storytelling. <laughs> <laughs> and a story of... And good gossip? And, well, you know, it's a story of collaboration. And collaboration, meaning literally laboring together, it means it's human beings working with other human beings to, to bring something intangible into the tangible world. And uh, which means, if humans are going to work with other humans, <laughs> the potential for transcendental connection is always there, and also for epic hair-tearing exasperation. <laughs> It's always there, you know, it's like, I, I mean, I look at, and, and the, so it's not really even about Spider-Man the musical as much as any project. You know, I look at um, I Stonehenge, you know, and, and you know, it's glorious. They had a good time it, making I mean, but, Stonehenge. Yeah, you think they must have had a good time, but they're very ha large rocks, you know, <laughs> that they were dragging from whales, you know, and, and so there must have also had to have been... <laughs> Epic uh, uh, fights, arguments, <laughs> you know, I, I look at that Stonehenge, I, you know, I see mystic druid mysteries, and I, and I see a, a whole lot of dysfunction. <laughs> <laughs> and did, in the end, the whole Spider-Man thing, I mean, did it make you really cynical about theater? Did it make you want to go back to writing one-man shows about the wandering Jew, or what? No, no. <laughs> No, the theater, you know, I mean, it, it, uh, the, um, almost everything I've ever written has been, to one degree or another, about grand ideals that fall short. So I, I probably cursed it, uh, but, but, but that there is something I find so endearing about that and so inevitable <laughs> um, mm. that, that, that we set our sights so very, very high and, uh, and inevitably, uh, you know, to, we're, we won't exactly reach it, um, but, but that striving is, um, I, I just find one of the best things about, you know, humans. So, so yeah, you know, so it, we tried, <laughs> fail, fail again, fail better. Yeah. Mm. Um, so, you know, one of the things of the many things that this play is about is our sort of um, uh, desperate need in the face of complete oblivion to assert our existence somehow to someone at some point. 
you know, and this question about immortality or just etching our names, yeah. you know. And I wondered, um, you wrote this play before you had children. Yes. Yeah. And obviously one of the things about having children is you can say, I was here because he there they are, something lasts. And I just was so curious about that impulse seems to be in a lot of your work, that sort of that that sympathy for the human condition of wanting to feel present. Ah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's a wild thing. I mean, it's like one of the last pages, actually, of my Spider-Man book talks about. So the, the, the biggest song uh, in Spider-Man, Turn Off the Dark, is called uh, Boy Falls from the Sky. It's just, you know, it's the rocker. It's, it was, um, was going to be our big hit. <laughs> and uh, Bono and Edge took that title. Boy Falls from the Sky. Nobody knows this. They took it from a poem by Auden. 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 Um, Auden. Yes. Uh, and Auden wrote the poem inspired by a painting by Bruegel. No. Bruegel. Bruegel. You got it all right. Called uh, Icarus. And this painting, it's like 17th century painting, typical Dutch seascape harbor painting of Dutch ships in the harbor, um, a man plowing his field in the foreground, and then in the little corner, there's a, a little splash and two little white legs coming out of the, no. out of the surf, as if he just painted at the end. And, and oh, the this title, is Icarus falling into the And the title of the painting is Icarus. And Alden wrote this poem called, yeah, he said, yeah, the old masters, they had it right, didn't they? You know, they, they, and he, it's a beautiful poem we're talking about. Um, th there must, you know, they, people must have um, noticed, you know, um, some, um, I, you know, green, uh, uh, white legs, you oh. know, from a green sea. They must have noticed something amazing, a, ball, a boy falling out of the sky. But uh, there are fields to plow and places to go, and so the uh, ship moves on. And... And it's, it's, it, and it was this sense, you know, even with Spider-Man, when everything, when the whole world, it seemed like, was paying attention to this, you know, what was, what was going on and with, uh, you know, during that preview period, we were on the cover of every magazine and all the rest of it. Even then, we knew this isn't going to last. And <laughs> at some point, you know, all this is going to get forgotten, uh, even if somebody ends up writing a book about it. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and, 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 and so that sense, again, was actually at the heart of, yeah. of Spider-Man, even, um, <laughs> even though it was, it was kind of a, a secretly embedded thing of that sense of, of um, you know, even, even Icarus, you know, falls he, go, he falls in the sky, amazing, 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 he's in the water, and uh, he's gone. So uh, was it a good song? Was it a good song? The song was great. Yeah, it's it was really song. great, especially the original demos. Um, they were really... <laughs> Great, but um, but yeah, uh, yes, that sense. Um, and yeah, and I saw that the afterward is in that program. <laughs> yeah, I, it just I, I don't know what to do with it. You know, the 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 size of the universe and the age of the earth and the fact that uh, every single person here is going to die, um, especially me. You know. Um, uh, I, I, you know, it just leaves me, um, you know, b bewildered in a capital B, you know, and, and I just, having those ideas at the, at the front of my brain at all times is, mm. is, you know, the reason why I want to uh, write at all. And the stamper, you know, that image is so, uh, it's so magical and it's so simple. And when he holds this thing up, I kept thinking, in another 20 years when there aren't books anymore, yeah. I wonder what this play will be. Yeah, it is a weird thing. Isn't it wild? It, 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 I've really been thinking about that. I mean, maybe I'm wrong and there will be books, but you know, we made this set. This is a little piece of theatrical archaeology here, where everything on this set comes from some production that we've done at ACT. It has like Bill Irwin's trunk from Scapin. It has, it has Tiny Tim's crutch and Scrooge's coat and, and the halberds from Marco Baricelli's Enrico Cuarto. And you know, like it's all like I look at this set and I know, everything. I know what everything is up there. 
But nobody else, it'll all disappear. You know, it's like just in my memory, and some of your memories have been coming here for a long time. And I sort of thought it's probably like that with the librarian. And when this play's done in another 30 years, and he says, this is my stamper, <laughs> people will really think it's like an archaeological artifact. <laughs> That's why we had him hold it under the light like a jewel. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> like you would when you dig something up from the pits of the Pompeii. Yeah, I, no, I had that sense even this time. I mean, when this first went up in 2001, um, I mean, yeah, even the internet was, was much more new. And, and right. I got the sense this time. So I was actually very, I'm a little weirded out thinking, oh yeah, 2013, how do they even do this show anymore? Um, when David came out, um, I, I was hit with this. Uh, there was a quality to me more than ever before, uh, almost that this librarian is a bit of a ghost, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and, and I thought, oh, well, okay, it can work more and more. Yeah. Like yeah. that. Yes. You know, and mm. uh, I, yeah, so I was okay with that. I think that's right, because there's no point. I mean, you could say, okay, today he would just Google the, you know, the wandering Jew or that's, whatever. That's, that's right. Yeah. But you yeah. know, I don't think that matters at all, because actually, this thing about the way each of us tries to give meaning to our lives by endowing whatever we can with meaning to get us to the next place is a much bigger idea than just this particular librarian search, you know? Sure. On the other hand, we did have a group of librarians come. <laughs> yes, and that was maybe the nicest audience we had. <laughs> because the Dewey Decimal System is still meaningful to them. <laughs> and when he gratifying. bored the, Chinese, yeah. the Japanese tourists with the story of the Dewey Decimal System, they really could relate, you know? <laughs> And they felt that they knew the beauty of that search. Yeah. Now, the, the, in New York, the, um, David Chandler um, did it in New York. And one night, he, he said, oh, man, the audience was on, f I was on fire tonight. <laughs> they, they were whooping it up. I, I, he was just, he was so pleased because he, um, he thought that he had finally absolutely nailed this piece and he didn't know that there was a librarian's convention in, in town and that basically the, the whole theater had been bought out by uh, <laughs> by 299 librarians who were finally seeing themselves valorized yeah, yeah, on stage so. amazing did you know when you wrote it how funny it was i mean was that so, or are you just sort of naturally that's your own quirky well i sense mean of i humor. try uh, i mean i <laughs> Uh, if it isn't, I, I mean, I hope on some level uh, uh, everything I write uh, does have that humor. Um, it's another way of connecting to the audience, you know. Mm. It's a, uh, I mean, just on an almost practical level, the actor needs to know, am I, you know, you can't really see them most of the time. So just knowing that, that they're out there, you know, I, I, I think that they're in a, in a play. Uh, there's really no such thing for me as a protagonist. It's all about, um, it's all about relationship, mm. right? Uh, that's, that's the engine. That's what, that's what keeps something dynamic. So you have a one-person show. There's no other person. So, so where's that? So the other character in this show is you. Uh, it, you know, what is the central uh, question, uh, need? dynamic in this, in this play, and it's for uh, this one to convince you. Um, and so uh, you need to have that kind, of, um, that kind of tension and that kind of tangible relationship. And for me, uh, uh, humor and, and mm. you know, hopefully l laughter um, is a way of, of communication. And then the flip side is the incredible generosity of his vulnerability you know, which really sneaks up on you, but it's a love story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, she, Rosa Vanderwerf um, what, wasn't, uh, she, when I first did it at Yale, she, she was there, but, but not quite as there. And, um, mm. and that's when um, Randy White, the, the first director of the piece in New York, who had seen that production and said, I, I, I needed to, you know, I really wanted to know more about Rosa. Yeah. And, um, and so she, she showed up more.
Well, because, and again, thematically, one of the beautiful things is you never know when you're underneath the lintel and the choice is going to be made. That's right. And yeah. then it disappears and no. you didn't know you're one love. You never and it's know. Gone. You never know. Yeah. It's fabulous. Yeah, I know. know. <laughs> so we're going to have to stop, but I particularly, because no he said the other half, no, but we're going to go outside. Look, oh. of, of the equation is you. Thank you for being yes, such you. a wonderful audience. And please join Glenn if you would like out front and you can buy a book. So thank you. Thank you, thank you for coming.